Welcome to Public Affairs Roundtable, a discussion of current events in the nation and around the world and how they affect the people of Indiana. Here's your moderator, Larry Long. Did we strike a blow against terrorism, as President Reagan says, or did we merely aggravate that mad dog who the president says is responsible for much of the terrorism in the world today? Today on Public Affairs Roundtable, we'll talk about the U.S. airstrikes into Libya, the Libyan response, the world response. Our panelists are Tom Sargent from the Department of Political Science, Ball State University, Mark Popovich from the Department of Journalism here at Ball State, and John Rouse, also from the Department of Political Science. Tom Sargent, are we at war? Uh, technically, uh, figuratively, literally, are we at war? Well, we certainly aren't at war in a technical sense uh, or in a uh, legal sense. Um, we've had a, we're in a war in a figurative sense in that uh, we decided that we're going to strike back uh, against Colonel Gaddafi and other terrorists um, and terrorist activities throughout the world and we're going to do that through the use of some military force, and we did that on Monday night. And so in, in that sense, we are, I suppose, in a state of war. John Rouse, justified or not justified, uh, world opinion is somewhat divided. The world is divided, Larry, and it's going to be divided on this kind of issue. A couple of things we could look at. First of all, if you were a citizen from some other planet, and you had been watching these events of terrorism, either state terrorism or individual terrorism on both sides, you would ex have expected something to occur in terms of what the American military did several days ago. Uh, so, and, and also we have to look in terms of a very crucial issue in terms of are nations uh, friends or do they have interests? And so each nation, then, is speaking in terms of its interests. So I think we have to look at these kinds of things. Also, we could look at a, maybe a, a third point, and that is the issue of change. You know, so much of the political economics of the world are based upon the results of World War II. It's been some 46 years since that time end, uh, ended, and so I think we also have to look at that. So if we look at several issues in terms of how these things are evolving nations are they uh, do they have friends or do they have interests how does this country respond to the issue of change and public policy what we had several days ago with the use of military was a focus a focus upon trying to reach a consensus in terms of what should be the public policy in this case military or public policy mark popovich do we know enough right now to support the president? Do we know enough to say that perhaps he was wrong? Has the press done its job, I guess my question is, in, in getting to the bottom of this and saying, okay, Mr. President, where is your proof? How do you justify what you did? It's interesting, Larry, because I think uh, two, um, two trends have occurred, uh, basically, as I read American newspapers. I think the American public is behind the president. and I, and. Uh, a recent poll in Newsweek magazine uh, showed that um, the American public uh, felt that uh, uh, attacks against Libya were, were worth the risks of, of terrorist activities. But on the other hand, I think the press is really reluctant to um, uh, support, not necessarily support the president, but they're really reluctant to see us become involved in another conflict because we, we're involved in a South American uh, situation or the Central American situation. And uh, now we're moving into the, we, we've uh, actually unloose, uh, unleashed, unleashed our troops in, um, in the Middle East. And um, the press is a little skeptical at this point in time about what we're doing and why we're doing it, because many of the columnists in American newspapers uh, actually feel that uh, Gaddafi is only a symptom. He's not the uh, problem here. Uh, we, need to, we need to solve the major issue, which is a Palestinian homeland, which has uh, created the terrorist activities in the first place. Tom Sargent, let's go back to where we were talking about war or not war. The, the president had to go through protocol, had to go through a procedure before he, in fact, could get involved in or get the U.S. forces involved in, in Libya. Did, did we follow protocol? Well, uh, the War Powers Act, which I assume is what you're talking about, grew out of the Vietnam War. And uh, the idea of Congress at that time was to, in 1973, when the act was passed, was to try and curb the power of the president uh, in terms of independent military operations abroad. 
and to inject uh, Congress into the uh, act a bit in terms of uh, using American troops overseas. So one of the first responsibilities of the president, uh, if he plans to use American forces abroad, is to consult with Congress uh, in that regard. And so that's what he did, apparently, about 4 o'clock on, uh, on uh, Monday afternoon. And I understand that uh, the consultation was timed in such a way so that the planes which had uh, left Britain were on their way, but not at a point uh, at which they could not have been recalled if there had been really serious, significant uh, opposition to that, uh, to that mission. Uh, and he consulted Congress in the form that he talked to the chairman of the House uh, Foreign Affairs Committee and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Luger, uh, in this case, and uh, the uh, chairman of other House and Senate committees dealing with armed services, and uh, then probably the other leadership in the House and Senate, uh, but not the entire body, the small group of persons. And uh, I, I understand from the reports we've heard from the press that uh, there was generally positive support from from uh, those uh, congressmen and senators with regard to the president's action. There was some criticism, though, that the president had merely notified Congress and not really consulted, is the word you use. One can argue that. Uh, it depends whether you're consulting or informing, and depends what your interests are. I think uh, uh, the president uh, informed and consulted <laughs> with Congress on Monday afternoon. Tom, do you think that... Um if the terrorist activity continues, uh, continues and even increases, that this will, will present special problems in terms of how we do interpret the War Powers Act? Well, it may be. I'm not so sure that the War Powers Act is, is as relevant to this situation as it is to some others. Uh, by the nature of the kind of military operation which we are apt to engage in, it's a pretty quick hit-and-run affair. Uh, it's not something that should, at least, engage American forces overseas over the long term. Uh, of course, long term, what is that? And under the War Powers Act, it's 60 days. Uh, you need to get some authorization from Congress to uh, operate abroad uh, in a, on a military, on a war footing, fighting footing, uh, before, uh, uh, in order to keep those troops overseas. So, uh, our, the nature of the operation, like Monday night, uh, was pretty quick. And uh, I would assume that would be the pattern to be followed in the future. I don't think the president wants to engage in some long, drawn out affair overseas. Uh, that, he was thoroughly burned in Lebanon with that. Uh, and incidentally, in Lebanon, there was a, a compromise reached. The War Powers Act was, uh, was admitted to be applicable, but a compromise was reached with regard to the way it was applied. So uh, I just have a feeling that uh, it'll be a quick thing, and it may not be entirely applicable uh, in the future. Tom, I, th I think the principle behind the War Powers Act is an effort to develop consensus not only in the administration, whatever administration it happens to be, but also in the Congress and, of course, with the American public. And so the purpose here, I think, is to try to get widespread support for a policy in very difficult times. Uh, terrorism, of course, is going to be with us. And the crucial question that we have to ask as we are, are Hoosiers, of course, is what can the citizen learn about how to respond to these very confusing kinds of times. And the challenge is to come up with a nonpartisan policy that involves a response to terrorism. And that, that policy we don't have, have at this time. Well, military force uh, is, um, uh, is one way in the very short term of building some consensus because there's a tendency, as you know, John, historically, for uh, the American people to rally around the president uh, in, a, in a crisis situation. The very use of military force tends to imply crisis. Now, uh, if over the long run, and by long run, the next six months or a year, we find that, in fact, terrorism has not decreased, but it has tended to increase, then you're going to hear arguments made, well, we shouldn't use that military force because that has simply exacerbated the problem rather than improved it. If you want to punish Gaddafi, or you want to punish terrorists, okay, that probably uh, was done on Monday night, but uh, we won't know for some time whether or not it was effective in deterring. Yeah, terrorists. just quickly, mm -hmm. I, at this time, we don't know if the infrastructure of terrorism in Libya has been broken or has been damaged. Uh, and the, at, the question is, also, is that military has to be used very incisively, and all that military force uh, trying to do away with terrorism was obviously the use of much military force to do away with terrorism. And the question is, 
was it used incisively in this case? Well, and some Europeans have clearly said that it was not. In fact, we used a baseball bat to swat a fly. Uh, one can argue with that. Point. Agree or not agree with that, but that uh, is one case. And the other point one might raise is uh, how surgical can these strikes be? The president said he did not want to harm innocent civilians. On the other hand, it's clear that uh, from our reports we've gotten, and I will say that my impression is we've gotten reports only from Libyan television in terms of visuals. Now, I could be wrong about that. Maybe we've actually gotten some, some, some um, film footage from American television, mm -hmm. but what we've seen from Libyan television shows quite a bit of civilian, what I call civilian damage and diplomatic damage in the sense the French embassy and some other uh, diplomatic establishments were hit. So I'm not sure how, how, how uh, convinced I am that surgical strikes are possible in this day and age. Uh, one wonders about that. Congressman Dan hmm. Burton was on our program a few weeks ago. He, and, he hinted, he, that, well, he encouraged, I guess, the United States to take some kind of strong action against the Libyans, against those who train terrorists. It was his uh, report to us that the report, the intelligence reports were that the Libyans and others would, in fact, surround their terrorist training camps with civilian populations, women, children, so that if there were any kind of strike, that those kinds of people would be killed and elicit that kind of uh, world sympathy for their, for their cause against the United States. Uh, I suppose that's not surprising. It may have happened this time. I don't know. The French embassy clearly is not... Uh, deliberately near a terrorist camp, but on the other hand, who knows? In your own opinion, Tom, do you, do you, read, do you think that we have, uh, do you think that, that we exhausted all of our economic and, and uh, uh, political uh, alternatives uh, in this situation? Do you think that the military force was justified in this instance? Well, you've asked me two questions. <laughs> um, I think probably there were some additional things we, one could have done short of military force. They would have probably caused a great deal of controversy and uh, discussion. Uh, for example, one could have said, uh, "Okay, uh, Libya, you're through diplomatically in this world. Uh, we're not going to we're not going to pay any attention to the, your diplomatic immunity of your of your um, diplomats. We're not going to uh, let uh, Libyan diplomatic pouches be sent through uh, without inspection." If we could have gotten the Western Europeans particularly to support that idea, it would have been a very positive step. There could have been a complete embargo of all uh, air, airline flights to and from Libya. That would have been one way of, of helping. Again, it takes support from other places. I get the impression that um, President Reagan felt himself very much pressed by what he perceived to be domestic public opinion on this matter and political opinion. You've got to remember, he campaigned in 1980 on a platform which indicated he was not going to allow Americans to suffer the same kind of indignities again they'd suffered in the Carter administration and, and uh, particularly with regard to the hostages in Iran. Uh, we've had several acts of terrorism against Americans over the last uh, six months or so. And I just have a feeling that the president may have seen himself in a position you have to do something. And this was what he chose to do, and it was a very dramatic strike. As you mentioned, economic and diplomatic action sanctions against Libya really won't work without that kind of support. But is it not easier for the United States to say economically, okay, w there will be no trade, there will be no relations with Libya? Much easier for us to say that than for the Western Europeans to. Yes, and we've said it, and we've done it. In fact, there's very little more for us to cut out uh, with regard to relations with, uh, with Libya. But uh, the, Western, you know, the Western Europeans clearly are not, do not feel themselves and their interests, to use your phrase, John, as much threatened as uh, we clearly do. And the Europeans, the impression I get is the Europeans feel that we're making a big deal out of not as much. Is there, is there an obligation of the president at some point, if he wants to enjoy or continue to enjoy the popular support of Americans for such actions, for him to come forth with more proof, uh, the specifics of why it is that he thought this action was justified? At this point, the American people have pretty much a superficial explanation of, yes, Colonel Gaddafi is responsible for terrorism, and we did intercept a message uh, just before the bombing in Berlin of the discotheque. Uh, don't we need to know more? Yes. The question is, uh, what more can we know without compromising some intelligent sources? Uh, much of this kind of, what shall I say, much of this kind of comment by the president is going to have to be taken on faith. Uh, I agree with you. It would be nice to have some proof. Uh, 
photograph that you commented a while ago. The photograph of the uh, in Nicaragua of the uh, people loading drugs or something on the plane. I couldn't tell those <laughs> drugs or 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 linen. I mean, I didn't know what the, they were doing in that photograph. Uh, so it's very hard for the layman, uh, unless you actually can see missiles as one could in the Cuban Missile Crisis in photograph, to be able to say yes, this is in fact uh, proof to me that uh, that uh, these camps were terrorist camps and that there were people there who were committing terrorist acts. I, I think it's going to be very tough to uh, create proof or to submit proof uh, to the American people that we all understand. Isn't that sort of the charge of the press at this point, Mark Popovich, to, or if not the charge, it'll be at least it's, it's piqued the curiosity of the press as to just what are the specifics? Just who is involved? Give me times, give me dates, give me places, give me numbers. Well, I think so, and I, and I think that uh, the press is doing a pretty good job of trying to dig out some of that information. Um, Newsweek magazine, for instance, in the last couple of weeks had a had a um, uh, a piece uh, by a couple of uh, uh, writers who had uh, actually um, sort of traipsed the terrorist trail, in other words, and uh, had talked to a number of terrorists and uh, eventually actually trying to find out uh, why they're doing it, what they're doing it uh, for, etc. And and I think that uh, on the basis of their discussion. Uh, we're finding that uh, Libya is, is uh, not necessarily the focal point of terrorist activities. I mean, uh, there seems to be some evidence that Syria is pretty heavily involved in this, too. And that's one question that comes up. Why didn't President Reagan go after Syria, too? Uh, um, so there's a, number of, there's a number of questions that need to be answered. Uh, but I do think the press, if, if they're guilty of anything here, I think it's probably uh, reporting too well uh, because um, they, they're... they're, they're uh, they've had access to terrorist camps. They've had access to terrorist leadership, and uh, they're giving us so much information. I think that it is uh, creating a uh, sort of a fear psychosis in the United States. I, I think people are afraid to go overseas. Um, tourism has dropped, um, and it makes you wonder if uh, we could do with a little less information on, on this particular issue. Mark's point is an interesting one. You recall, in, uh, uh, and I'm, my date's a little hazy now, but I'm tempted to say a year or so ago when the TWA airliner was hijacked uh, in uh, Lebanon. And the Shiite group uh, was responsible, apparently, or a Shiite group was responsible for those uh, those actions. The press uh, showed the delightful scenes of luncheon parties and uh, toasting each other, the hostages and the uh, and the uh, captors host toasting each other and, and uh, enjoying themselves. Uh, I mean, I, one wonders really how much terrorism there is uh, with this sort of thing. And I, my point is that the press may be a little overactive in this regard. Hmm. I think uh, you know Tom's example is a good one because um, I think we're dealing here with a, if we want to call him an enemy, a very sophisticated enemy that has uh, uh, a, a good understanding of how to manipulate the media. And I don't think there, I, I think there's an overt attempt to uh, actually give their side of the issue, and they've been very successful. Probably uh, one of the most successful groups that we know of in recent history. I mean, we really didn't hear the Vietnamese story, we really didn't hear, hear the Korean story, but we're really hearing the terrorist story. And uh, they're using the American media to uh, to get that story out. Mark, uh, I wonder if the impressions that we get from the media are not mostly negative as far as uh, these kinds of developments. Uh, that there's too much pessim pessimism in terms of fear, and and it it seems that. Uh, uh, this kind of response is is what the terrorists might indeed want. I, uh, I think they're accomplishing that goal. Uh, yes, there is a great deal of pessimism, I think, on the part of the press. I, I think generally they will support the president. Uh, uh, I think, as Larry points out, they'll be looking for some specific facts and information in order to justify you know, what he's doing. But I think, uh, as I said earlier, I think there's a real concern that we're being dragged into another uh, foreign altercation and uh, I think the press has, um, after, after going through Vietnam and, and a couple of these other terrorist activities and things, and of course uh, Central America, is uh, really taking a, a devil's advocacy, playing a devil's advocacy uh, here uh, in an attempt to try and bring some perspective to the problem. Uh, hopefully the president will read the newspapers, uh, and he has to some extent, but uh, um, it, it, it only, you know, only time will tell us just... Uh, how effective they are in terms of um, in, uh, informing the American public about yeah, the I, I, issue. I think one of the problems we have in trying to analyze this issue is that we're trying to analyze the uh, details of a very 
global issue. We have to look at if, if the world is all divided up in terms of politics and economics, we know that in terms of politics, the Israelis were able to get the land in the Middle East through the help of the Americans after World War II. And so in a sense, it's a political issue. I mean, what, what the Arabs are fighting over is a homeland for the Palestinians. I mean, that's one of the antecedents of this whole issue. I think another issue, as you have both implied, is the focus upon economics. When the economics of the lack of travel in Europe, the, the dollar, and, and, and so uh, persons like uh, Prime Minister Papandreou of Greece, uh, these kinds of people are going to have to decide, do we have more travel from the United States and do we protect that travel, which means economics, or do we give in to the whims of terrorists? And, and the policy of trying to respond from a Western European American kind of point of view is what we have to focus upon. I think that's a very tough, uh, tough question, John. It, it, let's solve the roots of terrorism and uh, then we may end terrorism. And uh, I think that's a pretty tough one for us to, to pursue and I make the, this point. Nobody would like to see the uh, Arab-Israeli dispute settled more than I would. I think it'd be uh, terrific to, to get that thing settled, if that were done overnight, however. First of all, there's no settlement possible that would appease all the terrorist uh, groups uh, and all the uh, Palestinian terrorist groups uh, everywhere. That, uh, you, know, you, couldn't, you couldn't achieve a settlement that would do that. Uh, secondly, that wouldn't handle the uh, Iranians, for example, who have a different kind of uh, agenda for terrorism. That wouldn't handle a lot of the Western European terrorists who are now sort of professional terrorists uh, who want to simply bring down society or want to have some kind of uh, new state, uh, a new society in uh, Western Europe, uh, French, British, uh, and uh, German groups, and Italian groups for that matter. So the roots of terrorism are so diverse and so complicated that for us to try and attack those roots, and we should do that, uh, I agree, simply for simple justice, but that's not going to end terrorism. Uh, you're going to have to do more than that. Why Gaddafi then, and why now? Is it is it a message to the Syrians, to Arafat, to whomever? Is it a beginning of some tough tough guy stance on terrorism? Well, first of all, Mark raised the issue about Syria. Syria is much too close to the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. That would uh, engage mm -hmm. the Soviet The Soviet Union would have to respond in a very real way right. if their chief client, although not a complete satellite, I'm not suggesting mm -hmm. that, but their chief client in the Middle East were attacked. Uh, secondly, uh, Assad is is not on the periphery of Arab of the Arab nation, both literally and figuratively, <laughs> geographically and, and figuratively. Uh, he is in the center of it, and Gaddafi is a is a kind of uh, well to use the president's phrase, kind of flaky character who uh, is not widely respected and admired by the rest of the Arab world. Assad has his enemies, but he also is admired as a very shrewd and able uh, politician. I, I agree with Mark's analysis that there's a lot more terrorism that emanates out of Syria and the Assad government than there is out of Libya and the, and the Gaddafi government, but there are things you can do and things you can't do. And Gaddafi, Gaddafi is an easy target. Gaddafi was a relatively easy target. That's right. I emphasize relatively easy target. Yeah, I, I would also agree that at some point in time the trend has to begin, begin to go the other way. And uh, as you say, Gaddafi was an easier target and uh, hopefully from the administration point of view, the effort is to swing it in the other way. I think as we look at terrorism, uh, our whole society has been built upon free markets and the access to markets. And what terrorism does, it prevents our whole concept of political economy from realizing its full potential. If, it, if, if we're told to stay out of a certain part of the world because we want to sell something there, this is a threat to our way of life. We have also been a country in terms of freedom of movement and travel. And so the American people have not been a passive people. They've been a very active people who want to do things and sell things. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I guess I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. What next? I mean, we've bombed Tripoli. We've hit, hit areas inside Libya. What next? Uh, I, I guess the world is asking the same question. Indeed, what next? Well, I think there'll be some other terrorist attack. Uh, there'll be some reprisal. This is in the character of, uh, of the Arab and that Middle East. There'll be a, an avenge, a revenge for uh, the attack on uh, on uh, Libya. I don't think there's any question about that. I, I, would, have, where. I would have to <clears throat> agree. I think this is the tip of the iceberg. I think 
I think the uh, threats of the, of, the, of the terrorists that we've seen on television, I think, will probably come to pass. I think, I think that there's going to be a, a, a period of retribution. And, and, then, and then we respond again? And then we have we set off a chain of events here that's merely going to aggravate this, that, that's going to escalate the violence? No one could argue that that is a scenario. Uh, I'm not sure that necessarily have to follow that, but I could see uh, that being a scenario for the next, uh, well, two or three years. That sort of thing. Larry, I, I think that the, the part of the thing for our listeners and viewers to think about is to be patient with this issue because it is a long-range, very complex one and ask for sane, intelligent policies from your politicians and not look to partisanship, because this is a nonpartisan, long-range, historic kind of thing we're dealing with. And uh, uh, it, it demands some sort of uh, real involvement by the American people in terms of knowing what to expect and how to deal with these, kind of, with these kinds of things in the future. We cannot go through life as a society being fearful of doing something because somebody's going to shoot us or something of this sort. That's a very difficult kind of challenge, but it is indeed a challenge. Well, has President Reagan led Americans to expect something more of this strike than can be reasonably be expected? He says it's a blow against mm -hmm. terrorism. I mean, isn't he in a sense saying to Americans, hey, we've taken the first step toward cutting it out, toward letting these people know that they, they try anything, will retaliate. Uh, has he not led us to expect that this is something very significant when in fact it is not? Well, I think he's led us to believe, and I, and I think he's right in this regard, that, it, that uh, it ought to be considered a deterrent, that the strike ought to be considered a deterrent, a message to other terrorists and to Gaddafi. Now, we don't know if it's going to be a deterrent or not, uh, and the scenario that we discussed a few minutes ago would indicate that one way is that it's not going to be. On the other hand, there might be a, a le there will probably be some response, but it may not be uh, another scenario. Be that wouldn't be as great as one uh, might expect, and that in fact these might taper off, particularly from emanating from Libya, might taper off over the next few months. That's the second way of looking at it, um, and I'm not sure, but I think we'll just have to wait and see what happens over the next few months. Is it in fact from a, a political? point of view, is somebody going to benefit? Is somebody going to lose? I mean, you talk about domestic politics. Yeah, I think somebody's going to lose. I think what we have here is a very definitive conflict in values. And our, our way of life is very very different from the Arab way of life, or we're many out, of the Arabs. We're out of time today. Thanks to our panelists, Mark Popovich, Tom Sargent, and John Rouse for their commentary. I'm Larry Law. Thank you for being with us. If you have comments regarding this program, please address them to John Rouse, Box 149, Muncie, Indiana, 47305. The producer for Public Affairs Roundtable is John Rouse. Associate producers are Cecil Bohannon and Bill Mosier. This program is a production of University Media Services, the Department of Political Science, and radio and television stations on the campus of Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana.